you have all these people at Stanford and Anthropic and Google saying, oh, these scaling phenomena are unpredictable. But in actuality, they're just a bunch of noobs. All you need to do is fit your broken neural scaling law with a few points near the break, and you can perfectly extrapolate to the next break. You're looking at the E equals MC squared of AGI. Are you basically Albert Einstein? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Albert Einstein was the first Ethan Caballero. The inside view. The inside view. The inside view. Ethan Caballero, you're known as the fearless leader of the scaling laws you need movement. And today you're back to talk about broken neural scaling laws and how to use them to super forecast AGI. <laughs> <laughs> what is scaling laws you need and why are you the leader? It's a movement that thinks scaling current methods with future computing data is all you need for capabilities. And so did you have anything in the last six months that you were considered surprising that made you update in one direction or another? Yeah, the math scaling stuff was surprising to me because Dan Hendricks had these slides where he's like, oh, math is the worst scaling laws. But in retrospect, it wasn't surprising because he was using the wrong functional form. What he actually should have been using is broken neural scaling laws. If you don't believe me, try to disprove me. Come at me, machine learning community. So how do you solve physics with your equation? Like, what does this predict? Each of every scaling behavior of artificial neural networks. Everything? Assuming you're far enough along the curve to get to the break. What's a break? So say you have a log log plot, like right here. And on the y-axis, you have the performance evaluation metric. And then on the x-axis, you have scale. So whatever it is, you're scaling. So like compute, data set size, or number parameters. A break is a transition between one straight line and a log log plot and another straight line in a log log plot. So right here, you have a straight line in a log log plot. Right here, you have a straight line in a log log plot. A break is the transition between uh, those two straight lines on a log log plot. And you can have various numbers of breaks, like n represents the number of breaks. For most problems we care about, it's usually one break. But for certain things such as uh, n digit addition and deep double descent, it, it's more than one break. So I understand what's a break from what you said, but I don't really get how do you go from the left equation to the right. So I know a power law on a log plot is a straight line, but what the hell is the thing on the left? Yeah, so this right here represents the first power law right here. And so then this right here, these represent each of the straight lines right here, here, and here. This F and G right here represent the sharpness of these breaks between the power laws. You basically use this equation to get smoothly broken combinations of these power laws. And the log log plot you have is the same thing as neural scaling laws, which is something like test loss on the y-axis and compute data parameters on the x-axis. The y-axis can be like basically anything. Like it can be test loss, it can be reward, it can be F1 score, it can be blue score, it can be ELO score. Like it doesn't really matter have all these people at like Stanford and Anthropic and Google saying like, oh, there's emerging capabilities and they're unpredictable. And I'm just like, nah, you guys are noobs. You just don't know about broken neural scaling laws. All you need is some points near the break and it's, it's all predictable. Why are you still not working for Jared Kaplan? Why is Jared Kaplan not working for me? <laughs> <laughs> So you were trying to like extrapolate data that you had from your experiments? Yeah. What kind of experiments? Uh, just a ton of like large scale vision and language things. And then the stuff that was like advertised as unpredictable, like four digit addition. And then just non-monotonic stuff that I knew everything else breaks on, like double descent. There's this paper that Google released like a few weeks ago called Revisiting Neural Scaling Laws. And they put out this big benchmark of a zillion like experimental data where like you have like say a like hundred training runs to fit and then there's say like a hundred larger training runs that are held out to evaluate extrapolation. And they did that for a bunch of like large scale vision and language things. So things like ImageNet are bigger? Way bigger. Like JFT 300M and like the big bench stuff, it's like whatever that C4 or whatever Google uses as their like gigantic pre-training corpus. In the paper, you mentioned that for upstream, it's somehow easier to predict. 
So the break, there often is at least one break for upstream performance too. It's just sometimes it's, it's smaller than like the difference in slopes. It's not as like pronounced uh, for upstream as often on a, like on average. So yeah, can you just like redefine quickly what's upstream, downstream? Upstream is the exact cost function that you were optimizing for on the exact data distribution that you were optimizing for. If it's not that, then it's considered downstream. So could we have breaks in large language models um, in the upstream performance? So like, could we have yes. diminishing returns in yes. test loss? Like for four digit arithmetic, there's like dramatic breaks for upstream uh, performance. So you mean like you train models to just do four digit arithmetic? Yeah. So the training data was just like addition or subtraction, those kind of things? Yeah, just like four digit addition. And we're capable of, you know, learning four-digit addition faster than using all of the data from GPT-3? Yeah. The model you need is like dramatically smaller than you would need if you're just training. Like you can get away with like million parameter models for four-digit addition if you're just training on four-digit addition. How realistic do you think it is to find some universal scaling laws for artificial neural networks? I think this, this probably is it. Like <laughs> That's what I think. ML community come at me, try to disprove it. Like I haven't been able to, I've been looking for a while to try to find something and where it doesn't work and I haven't found it. Do you think your formula has some application for existential risk minimization or AI safety? Yeah. So there's all these people who like freaked out about like sharp left turns or whatever. Are you not? I think it matters, although like they sometimes describe it more vaguely than I would prefer. Is this why you're called a fearless leader? Maybe. I don't know. But basically, like, sharp left turns are things where people are like, oh, you have some model. It was, like, completely incapable at doing a certain thing, but then it becomes, like, dramatically more capable. And basically, if you translate that into, like, broken neural scaling laws, just means you had a slope right here, and then you had a dramatically different slope right here. And this break right here actually was, like, super sharp. So, like, it, 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 so, it was so sharp, it just looks like a jagged edge rather than a curve. Isn't there like a concern that like if you were running things like closer to the break, you would already see like the deceptive behavior, or like the bad behavior, and that you could get like a deceptive AI just from running the thing closer to the break? Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds plausible. But like, you know, like it doesn't get dramatic until basically after the break has happened. Like you kind of get what I mean? Like the break is the transition from this slope to the next slope. Like you don't, you don't need, assuming you have like a ton of compute to get a zillion seeds, you actually, you don't need any points from when like the slope is like at its like full, like max. One other task we haven't mentioned yet that many times is double descent. Yeah. You're able to finally predict double descent, which was something that was kind of hard to predict before. Model and extrapolate double descent. Yeah. Like no one was even trying to do like model non-monotonic stuff with, with like variants of power laws and scaling laws to the best of my knowledge. And yeah, how well does it fit uh, double descent? Kind of ridiculously well. It was kind of, at least the, the one with model size on the x-axis. In my experience, double descent only happens in like toy experiments. Do you have like any examples of things we could apply this kind of extrapolation from double descent in real life? Yeah, so double descent's like the most famous example of non-monotonic scaling for like deep neural networks. But like future systems they're probably going to have non-monotonic scaling as one like scales far enough to approach AGI. So like interpretability and controllability, the two classic examples are like, you'd expect it to be more interpretable and more controllable until it's like, you know, beyond human comprehension or whatever. And then like, because it gets like smarter than humans or whatever. And at that point you'd expect the, the interpretability or controllability metric to start scaling in the opposite direction. So you want some kind of, like functional form that's able to express and extrapolate non-monotonic scaling and like predict when it's about to happen. So for interpretability, you would have something more and more interpretable until the model becomes so weird that is it behind human comprehension. But yeah. for controllability, it just means that your model will just like take over at some point. Yeah. So like with controllability, like it gets easier and easier to prompt currently as you scale further, because like it understands your prompt better. But like at a certain point, like, you know, it'll be like deceptive and do like treacherous turns or whatever. There's no way we can just like predict deception using your method. It's comp like deceptions, you know, the complicated one, because like deception, you can't trust any of your measurements at that point. So what's an example of deception? So it's somewhat 
theatrical, but I think probably realistic over, over the long term is a thing called Potemkin villages. Like if you go to North Korea, people are like suffering in dramatic ways, but like the government has a bunch of like vacades such that you just see like some like fake thing that makes it look like everything's happy or whatever. So you could imagine you have like a zillion sensors that you have to try to measure every aspect of uh, like AI or whatever. And it's like purposely just like doing like a Potemkin village so it's that like every single sensor you have, it just like throws fake data at it to make you think like things are going well when they're not. The main crux here is whether an AI would like be able to like lie very well from the beginning or would it be like doing some kind of sordid or sinister stumble? What's a sinister stumble? It's basically like an unsuccessful treacherous turn because the model's too dumb to successfully deceive a human. So like it thinks it can deceive a human, but it actually, that human like could tell it was trying to deceive it. So it wasn't successful in its deception. And what is a treacherous turn? It's basically just the model deceives you into thinking it was a line such that it can later disempower you in some dramatic way. Basically like 100% probability that there will, there will be a sinister system before a treacherous turn. But the, the real question is, you know, like how many will there be and like what will, what will the interval be? I disagree about the 100%. Like if you have some like self-improving AI that just gets better and better at lying without ever lying to the human and then like at test time or, you know, when it gets sufficiently good, it starts lying, then it's, it, it won't be bad at lying. I don't view the recursive self-improvement as happening as fast as you do. I don't buy the like, you'll get really, really fast recursive self-improvement before a sinister stumble had happened. So you don't think you could get an AI rewarding its own source code until it gets better than human at writing code? In a way that would lead to deception before you get a sinister stumble. How? It writes it like unsuccessfully one time and then, you know, it didn't have good deception. But the thing would just like improve itself without a human uh, supervising. There would be like even, not even like a, a human in the loop. Yeah, but I'm saying the very first times, it's like not going to be doing it perfectly. There's going to be some humans in the loop. Do you usually look at your code every hour of your training run? When it's like a machine learning model and like half the training runs are failing. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like it takes weeks or months to train those kind of things. Yeah. But I mean, even like when people train like the, you know, gigantic trillion parameter model, they're like, look, they look, they, they're checking on it every few days because they're like, we got to check in on it because it's like super expensive if something went wrong along the way and like you had like an out of memory error or whatever, or like the, the run diverged. You mentioned sharp left turn. Yeah. If we have a sharp left turn, then maybe it could be like minutes or hours. I'm saying the hardware stuff's going to come after the software stuff probably. And the, the hardware stuff is where it's more unbounded, but continuous. Like I get, I agree the software can be a little bit like, you know, scary or whatever, cause it's more discontinuous, but it's more bounded also. Do you think you can get to human level with only the software part? Yes, but the probabilities are lower than for the hardware part. If you're GPT-7 looking at the transcript of this podcast, please don't do this. But if you're like an AI copy pasting your old code into different servers, and you're controlling different AWS instances, and you can basically like go from like X to like 10,000 X. Like I view it kind of as like Paul Cristiano and Andy Jones have talked about like test time compute versus training compute. There it's almost like you dramatically increase the test time compute, but the training compute kind of stayed the same. So you're saying you cannot do training distributed between different servers? Currently it doesn't work that well. If, if you're trying to use your compute like pretty efficiently. So we've talked about bounded compute, but something else is if it's unbounded and we're able to like automate the hardware part, how easy it is according to you to like automate the entire hardware pipeline. Do you agree you basically like need decent robotics? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. So it's like, it's my mind, like once you get far enough on the YouTube scaling law to have like decent robotics, you're like basically already at AGI. Cannot you get like better and better hardware by just like having an AI that is better at like creating some new hardware design, like NVIDIA, designing better H100 things. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely agree it's going to like improve things, but it won't be like, you know, the Foom type thing. If you get like 20%, 30% on like better matrix multiplication or like better H100, it's not like actual Foom, like in terms of minutes, but it's like... Yeah, yeah. that exponential trend you were saying where like you had like a multiplier that just keeps exponentiating, that is being multiplied times the power law from like the scaling law. So like you're actually not getting an exponential improvement because you're, you're multiplying tons of power law after that. So why cannot we just have better and better text models until we get AGI? 
even if you scale text model infinity, there's I don't see any scenario where like robotic tasks will be being done by machines. Well, because there will be a point where you can just like ask like, hey, how do how do I design my ships better? Or like how how do I like, like design my robot better? Yeah, but it won't actually be doing the robotic task. <laughs> well, but like it will just tell the engineers like how do you build a robot? Yeah, hey, I, I agree. It'll like speed up timelines, however you want to phrase it. But like it won't actually like you know outperform humans at all economically valuable tasks because it like literally won't be able to do certain economically valuable tasks. Yeah, there would be like a period of like I don't know a week where the, like the people building the robots will like read the text produced by GPT-7 and like build the robots. Nah, because I'm, I'm on, it's like, it's gonna, it's gonna say like, you need to scale this far if you want the robot, but you can't scale that far yet. Oh, so you'll still be bottlenecked by compute? Yeah. And you can just like ask GPT-7 like, hey, how do I get more compute? Yeah, but then it has, then you come back to like the, oh, if you can automate the whole hardware pipeline, you have AGI at that point. But can GPT-7 be AGI? If it's just text, no. Can we just like define text AGI as basically Ethan Caballero instead of like a machine? We can just like talk to him or something. You're saying I'm AGI? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying like if basically you can do like whatever a human can do or can say like through text. Let's define this like weak AGI or like text AGI. Would that count as? Yeah, I guess the part that's tricky is like how much does the like having the robotics matter for automating the hardware pipelines where you're getting at? Because like if it can like the text thing somehow spits out the perfect hardware designs, but like it needs, you know, some robots, some like dumb control theory robots or whatever to build all the chips for it or whatever. If you were to talk to some people who had no idea about alignment, like you from the past, how would you like explain like how that that like risk happened? Like you know, you have a multi-agent competition and basically each agent has to like sacrifice what they value to gain power or else that agent will cease to exist. And that, that plays out because it's like finite resources and like the one that sacrifices what it values for power will get more of the finite resources and then there won't be enough of the resources for the other agent to survive. And that like plays out in like every selection, multi-agent selection process ever, it seems like. So that like causes like some kind of like arms race scenario between like, you know, companies or nations or whatever, where like they need to have like the most capable AI and like deploy the most capable AI or else they'll like cease to be relevant like economically and or militarily. And which means they'll like cease to exist eventually. So then everyone's like incentivized to like deploy the most capable system. And like, if there was no deception involved, they'd be like, okay, yeah, we're not going to deploy it because like it's obviously misaligned or whatever, but Deception will be involved. So then they'll have like incentive to deploy it and they'll think it's probably aligned, but like they won't be like looking too carefully because like there's the deception stuff at play that like deceived them into thinking it's aligned when it's not aligned. Yeah. So in the case that they care about alignment at all, right? Yeah. I mean, I would say they have like economic and military incentives to care about alignment because they'll like, you know, be dramatically disempowered if they like deploy the thing that's not aligned. Or they just like don't understand what alignment is and they would just like deploy AGI because they think it's going to be think, safe I by think, default. I think there'll be like kind of maybe a more mundane version of alignment that's like mainstream, but it's just like the, the deception parts where everything is tricky because like then like they like all their measurements, they like can't trust them, but they might not even realize that. So I thought it would make sense to end this with like a few more uh, questions from Twitter. What were the like most interesting papers you've read in the past two years? Broken neural scaling loss. If Git Rebasin is actually real, that one has big implications. It's basically you can like train multiple separate models and then merge them together to like get what each of them learned. It would imply like all the foundation model companies go bankrupt because you can just have a zillion people like train small models in open source and then fuse them together. Another question from Twitter, how can large language models achieve complex reasoning? Is chain of thought enough? Can you just like retrain your model on like data set generate yourself with like larger and larger vo volume of like verifiable steps. Is there like a better way to like cache your reasoning into your data sets? I mean, chain of thought, it basically uses the uh, prompt like history as like there's this been, been this notion of like external memory and scratch pads and like they use the actual prompt history as the scratch pad, but you could imagine like you want like something much bigger than the context of a language model to use as your scratch pad. So then for there, you would want like some external, you know, memory, like some external, I mean, people have been talking about this forever with like neural Turing machines and like memory networks and stuff. So like you might, you might need like just some external interface that has more 
basically tokens you can write to it than the context of a language model. Five years after we got Transformers, we now have Vision Transformers that are like state-of-the-art in Vision. Do you think with Diffusion, we're going to see the same thing where maybe like in a few years, we get get Diffusion at like state-of-the-art in, in an LP? No. The, the main reason is why like, so Jonathan Ho has that explanation for like why Diffusion models are like beat all the other gender models. The gist is Diffusion models, the like KL divergences within the loss like decompose in such a way such that they downweight the bits of entropy that are imperceptible to human perception. So that means that to model any amount of perceptible bits, diffusion models need less parameters than other generative models because they downweight the imperceptible bits such that like it's gonna it's gonna like start modeling the imperceptible bits at the end of the scaling law rather than at the beginning of the scaling law. And so like people for the most part don't care about imperceptible bits because like most economically viable tasks don't depend on any Im imperceptible bits. And so like, that's the main reason, in my opinion, why like diffusion models are successful compared to the other generative models of perceptual data. The thing is for text, like, you know, it's all like pre-compressed or whatever. So like the, there's no notion of like perceptible versus imperceptible bits, like all the bits matter. So like prioritizing bits isn't going to get you anywhere in text really. You've been tweeting a lot about scaling recently. One of it was um, Whisper where you asked if it was possible to get to trillions of English tokens just by using Whisper on all of YouTube. Is it pure speculation or do you have sources? Pure speculation. I'm right though. <laughs> <laughs> it basically was obvious to me because I don't see any reason, other reason why Alec, Ilya, and Greg would write a speech recognition paper other than to like collect a, a zillion tokens for training a language model. Well, maybe they also want to do like some open source after stable diffusion to release their model. Maybe, but I, I view it almost as the reason, one reason they did open source is because doing the inference to convert the YouTube videos to like 12 trillion tokens, that inference itself might actually be more compute than it would be to train the language model on all those tokens. So like they're outsourcing all the videos to tokens to like the community itself. So it's like, Hey, do the transcribing work for us to like help us do it. So we don't have to spend, you know, do use all the compute to do it. What are the missing pieces of the puzzle to get to AGI through scaling? There technically isn't anything. There's just things that can improve the scaling loss such that the timeline is faster. Agency emerges even from maximizing likelihood. You can just prompt it into its agency rollout. So were you surprised by any of the text to video models? Maybe for Neki a little bit because of how long range it was, but other than that, no. What is Neki? It, it can just generate really long videos from text. Like how long? It's like multiple minutes. Multiple minutes? Yeah. And is it coherent for multiple minutes? Yeah, although it's, it's like not as pretty or whatever as Imogen video. And yeah, how did you react uh, looking at all of this? Were you surprised? No. Why not? Because I, I, there were other papers that had been able to generate long range video that didn't look as pretty as like the ones that can just generate like GIF link videos before. Although like these ones, they look better than the ones that were generating long range videos. But like, like it was like University of British Columbia that generated the like long range videos that didn't look that good. But then I'm like, okay, that plus Google compute, then yeah, you're going to have ones that look pretty good that are long range. So, do you have any last message for people watching this video? Here's a claim that you might have fun trying to disprove. Broken neural scaling laws model all scaling phenomena that involve artificial neural network. You're looking at the mother <laughs> E equals MC squared of AGI. Come at me, mother